Hey, this is Travis and Chris with Scala Summit. We're here with GuitarMessenger.com. Hi, I'm John Anderson here with Scale the Summit, and you're watching GuitarMessenger.com. And uh, you guys are on tour right now with Periphery and Fair to Midland. And, yep. uh, how's that going for you guys right now? It's going going really well. Last two couple shows actually sold out. So, good crowd, you know, every night. Uh, it's been really fun. All the guys in both bands are fun. As if anyone's ever seen videos of Periphery, they know they're a bunch mm -hmm. of jokesters. So, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun touring with those guys for sure. Great. And uh, how has this tour uh, differed with uh, others in the past? Smaller, I guess, just in size. But I mean, the one before this, we toured with Between the Bear to Me, Cynic, and Devin Townsend. And then the one before that was with Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. I mean, can't really get much bigger than that in like the progressive right. world. But right, it's right. Uh, but it's still fun. Like it's it's nice to like play the big venues, but it's also fun to play the more smaller venues, the more intimate venues where you're closer. You know, you got right. more of the vibe from the crowd and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you guys toured with uh, Protest the Hero for a little bit. How was that? Yeah, that was actually the first tour we got. Um, that was the shorter one. That was only two weeks. Mm -hmm. so we played actually a lot of the same venues that we played on this tour with that tour, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, that was a lot of fun as well. Those guys partied a lot, so it was, it was, pretty, <laughs> nice. in, it was pretty intense every night. So cool. Yeah, yeah it was still fun. So you guys, uh, from what I understand, you all were based in uh, L.A., and you uh, met at MI. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, tell us about that. All right, um, yeah, well, Chris and I have actually, we grew up together in Houston, and um, we started playing guitar together like in 2004, and we, he was, Chris was already enrolled to Musicians Institute to start later that year, and he just mm -hmm. convinced me to go with him, and I uh, didn't have much going on at the time either, so I was like, yeah, it's a great idea, so we moved out there, and um, we took, you know, two years worth of classes at MI, and mm -hmm. we'd, you know, been writing music together, and ended up finding our drummer and bass player, Pat and Jordan, Mm -hmm. at MI who are also enrolled at the school there and we just everything worked out really nice um we just started jamming together and um, recorded a four song demo started playing shows around LA mm -hmm. and school was coming to an end and we knew that we really couldn't be able to pursue the band full time living in LA or it would be a, a very big struggle um, right, right. so um, we convinced Pat and Jordan who we had only known for less than a year or a little over a year um, to move out of state back to Houston with us and we had a whole plan lined out and we've pretty much done everything that we said yeah. we were gonna do so gotcha. yep. that's great how would you say uh, you guys uh, conducted yourself as like a you know everybody says like a band is like a business and how would you say that you uh, as far as like your own self promo like what did you do about that from day one or just <laughs> yeah yeah I mean well, I know for one, we actually, we've done over like 3,000 handwritten demos that we passed out like when we first started, like over 3,000, like that we all just took turns handwriting. And, and believe it or not, like a cool story about that, which I was actually telling the kid who gave me a demo at one of our shows on here, mm -hmm. is that a year before we got the Dream Theater tour, the guys like went to a Dream Theater show in Houston and were passing out demos of songs off Monument, our first mm -hmm. record. And then like a year later, like we're on tour with them. So it was kind of... It's kind of a neat story, you know, like that just proves that hard work and like persistence like will really pay off. And as far as like promos, like every band now, so we took advantage of the internet, you know, with mm -hmm. Facebook and MySpace and, you know, pure volume when people actually got on pure volume and stuff like that. And, you know, Last of Him and all that and just promoting. And, and that's really all it is, is just that and interacting with your fans. Like we interact with like our fans, like probably more than most bands do. You know, I mean, I write back everybody on YouTube and Facebook and you know everything so every email that we get gets a response and stuff like that it's just you just have to show them that you care which we do you know we come out every night after shows the same thing you know and interact with fans and talk about guitars and yep. all that stuff so it's a lot of fun cool cool and um why don't we talk about your new album right now uh the collective um why don't you uh explain uh what the title means and how that's reflected in the music okay uh well we actually we spent a lot of time titling songs 
Okay. And then when it comes down to the record, we're actually even more picky, you know, because it's the you know the collaboration of the entire thing as a whole. And we've kind of done like the organic nature thing for a while and decided that maybe not to go super direct, even though it's still organic. I'll, I'll explain that as well. But just the collective as a whole, I mean, it's just a bunch of small pieces put together, you know, mm -hmm. forms one larger mass. And that's kind of what we were going for as far as like the new record, because it was, it was a little darker and not all of our songs were like strictly nature related like they normally are. But mm -hmm. uh, we just wanted something just I guess just to describe it as a whole. Then the collective, actually the cover art, the spiral on the cover art is called a, a Phyllotaxis spiral. Mm -hmm. And what it is is it's uh, plants, certain kinds of plants will grow in like a certain kind of spiral and that when you take a, I guess, a, just an on top shot of it, a bunch of the small little pieces form this like spiral shape, which is kind of where we got the collective. So being that we're all about organic and nature themed stuff, we wanted to keep it still organic. So the file of texture spiral is actually what my web guy came up with for that, and it worked perfectly because I was stressing a lot about mm -hmm. about the cover art because we wanted it to be still Skeletal Summit themed, you know, and still have the same kind of vibe, the organic nature. So it ties in indirectly, but it's still nature related. So it's kind of cool how that came out. He he really saved me on that one. So that's cool. Yeah. So um, you had like a, a team of artists uh, collaborating to a. Uh... Well, it's kind of. Me and, and uh, the guy that does a lot of all of my websites, he did the organization of the font and stuff for Carbon Desert Canyons, but that was like real photography from a guy in uh, Houston named Tom Kilty. But on the new one, we wanted to go not just straight photography, just try like actual art. So he basically came up with the idea and I, I loved it and said, you know, this and that. And he'd send it to me and we'd just give him our opinions of what we wanted changed and stuff. It wasn't very much. He's got like such a good eye. Me and him are so in tune as far as ex knowing exactly what each other wants. Mm -hmm. so it was actually a pretty easy process. Why don't we uh, talk about uh, the, the, the process that you guys went through uh, in the making of the album, like writing and recording. Like has this uh, been different like for uh, other albums in the past or? It actually was quicker this time. Like we start everything with guitars first. Mm -hmm. Guitars are written out start to finish pretty much. And you know, we'll change a little stuff here and there when we start adding drum and bass. But for the most part, guitars are done. I give it to Jordan and Pat, kind of explain to them kind of like what we're thinking, you know, as far as like quiet here, loud here, fast pace here, there and that. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of explain to Jordan, you know, hey, you know, for bass lines, maybe go this route. And I think we're all on the same page now being our third record that it went a little easier this time because we didn't really have to communicate as much. We just give it to him. He learns it, mm -hmm. you know, and writes his bass lines and Pat writes his, uh, his drum parts. And then, so kind of what we did this time was we, I'd give him one song and then like a week later we'd all meet up and play together and kind of talk about what we want to change or fix or add or delete or whatever. And uh, it really went smoothly, I think, than, than most bands you hear, like, you know, arguing and stuff. We don't really argue when it comes to songwriting. It's kind of yeah. a smooth process. And I think, like I said, we all have the same influences. We're all on the same page now after three records that it's just a smooth process and it's, it's actually kind of relaxing and fun to write. And then recording, we recorded at Audio Hammer with Mark Lewis, who did like Devil Driver and All It Remains. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's like a little more metal, but I just want to bigger production. Like our last one was a little bit flat in my opinion and lacked a lot of dynamics. So I wanted something with a bigger like heavy hitting sound to capture like the heaviness that we wrote. And especially on the new record, there's like a lot more heavy parts. So we were tracked with him. He's also a fellow guitar player. So it made getting guitar tones and dialing in everything perfectly a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And uh, him and Jason Sukoff, who runs Audio Hammer, are like both like really sharp guys when it comes to production. So we got, I think we, can all agree that we got exactly what we wanted as far as that goes. And one different thing uh, we did during the recording process is on, on both of our previous albums, we kind of just, you know, whoever decided to start, like Chris would normally start and go for however long he could take tracking, you know, four or five <laughs> hours, whatever. Right. And on this time, we decided to just take it song by song, which was Mark's idea. So basically, we start with one song, Chris would record his parts, I'd record my parts, or and then move on to Jordan, and obviously all the drums are tracked ahead of yeah. time. Yeah, we so. do scratch guitars before, like there's scratch guitars done so that Pat can track to those. So that way, you know, he at least knows where he's at, I guess, because with our music, it's like a little bit more tricky than just verse, chorus, verse, you know, whatever. Right, right. So uh, it, was, it was really smooth, though, I think, because Mark, he's really good at what he does. I mean, he records bands 24-7, you know, like all year long with really no breaks. So when we get in there, it's like once we get going, it's just like 
just hitting space bar constantly going, you know, so. Yeah. But recording the way that I just mentioned, it actually kind of gave each member a little bit of time to take a break and breathe mm -hmm. instead of tracking yeah. for hours at a time and really just tiring yourself out. And yeah. so it was, like Chris said, it was pretty smooth. Cool, cool. Yeah. Why don't you uh, describe any uh, influences as far as like other artists or people that you've toured with uh, that went into this album? Mm. That's actually, like when I'm writing, I actually like to not listen to a lot of music hmm. because I feel like when you, when you listen to a lot of music, then a lot of influence from other bands, songs will either subconsciously or on purpose come out in your writing. So I just like to keep my head clear. Plus, knock on wood, you know, I have a really quick writing process. And when I sit down and write, I just write and write and write and write mm -hmm. without, with little effort. And you know, seriously, knock on wood, hopefully that never goes away, you know, because <laughs> I don't want to like jinx my writing process. But when it comes down to that, I, I really just like to keep my head clear as far as like other ideas from other bands and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's bands that we all like, you know, like my favorite guitar player is Guthrie Govan. And, you know, he definitely makes me strive to want to be a better guitar player mm -hmm. for sure. Because, I mean, he's a, he's a great player, a good songwriter and, you know, fantastic improv player. And... Uh, I'm sure like Jordan and Pat can probably tell you like they have influences from certain other bands when they're writing their drums and bass. But as far as like guitars and stuff, like I really like to keep it so that it's more, you know, more us than, you know, somebody else, I guess, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. I know that's not a very good answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we talk here for a little bit? Um, what are you guys uh, using right now on the road and in the studio? And is it different from what you guys have been uh, experimenting with in the past? For gear? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're actually, me and Travis just switched over to Axe FX. Okay. So we're both using the Axe FX Live, running direct. Um, we still use our Mesa Boogie cabs. And then as far as what we used to use is all tube amps. Like we switched, we were on uh, Ingle Powerballs for like five years and we switched to Mesa Boogie Mark V. And uh, when everything, that happened after the Dream Theater tour, of course, like hearing the Mark V every night with Petruccia is like, all right, yeah. time to get one, you know? So, <laughs> so we got one and um, then the, the Axe effects kind of started to really whittle its way in there because Dweezil's app on the Dream Theater Tour was using him. And then when we did the Cynic and BT Bam and Devin, Devin and Cynic both all using fractals. So I was like, man, it just seems convenient because you get to eliminate massive pedal boards and not have to push a bunch, you know, pedal dance like, the entire time you're playing. And our yeah. music, it's, it's hard enough just to switch to a lead boost from like the technical riffs that we're playing right into solo. So it was really nice. So now we can switch up and have a bunch of new sounds. And it's so far, it's it's cleaned up our live sound like we've had more compliments about our live tone mm -hmm. than ever because running direct you don't have a mic which creates more noise when it comes out through the PA for the audience right. so what the audience hears is just clear direct sound coming out of the PA right from the guitar mm -hmm. so it's nice and then uh, Pat just switched over and got a new Tama kit and Jordan's still running his Eden bass gear so oh, cool cool yeah and as far as in the studio we actually we we had actually only gotten the Axe effects a little bit before the studio, so we hadn't had a lot of time to really mess with it and dial it in. But we used a combination of different amps. We used a Bogner Ubnershaw for a lot of the rhythm tones and 5153 for some of the rhythm parts and a hot rotted JCM 800 for all the leads that Mark had yeah. in the studio, which was really tasty. That sounding. thing was just turn yeah. it on and it was ready to it go. It was amazing. Yeah. And then for the clean stuff, we used some of the Axe effects and then actually just direct into Pro Tools. And yeah. then obviously mm -hmm. for any of the effects, we used the Axe effects. Yeah. And it worked out quite nice. Cool. <laughs> Could you uh, describe some of the, uh, the the patch settings that you use on the Axe effects? Uh, yeah. We. Uh, I'm trying to think, because I wrote 15 patches after we got out of the studio. We basically did the record, then got out, and then I went through and just wrote patches to, to all of the different sounds. And I want to say we used the orange for the a recto lot of the, orange, I think. Yeah, for, the, for, for a lot of the rhythm channels. Yeah, for the dirty rhythms, which is everyone I've told that to on tour. I honestly, like, we've made the patches a while ago now, and... I haven't even looked at them since, but a lot of the other stuff is like we've taken a, like a lot of the presets and altered them as well. So um, I think there was one, uh, the whales effect derived from, uh, I think it was called Ganymede or something like that. Hmm. It's close to the end, but yeah, we took a lot of them and just altered them. And then I think for, yeah, for all the distortion, we used the orange and then USA clean for, for mm, clean. Yeah, I think it was the USA clean. Yeah, yeah it started the... with that. Okay. Yeah. Well, honestly, we don't have too much crazy stuff going on. We yeah. kind of keep it somewhat simple, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. so. It's neat. A lot of people 
uh, they'll say that you know when you become uh, proficient enough as an instrumentalist or as any kind of artist for that matter, uh, you uh, eventually get into like this uh, reckless abandon kind of mindset, and uh, so much that you know in, in the middle of performing or even in your guys' case recording, uh, you you have the ability to surprise yourself and the audience. And uh, uh, my question is. Uh, what would you say is like your greatest element of surprise in performance or, or whatever? Well, we're not too much of like crazy dudes, but I'd say like we like to play everything note for note. Uh -huh. So we practice a lot, and I'd say like most people are like surprised that the album sounds like the album, and we, I, I want to say barely make mistakes. I don't want to jinx the show tonight, but right. <laughs> but but we do practice a lot. We all spend like I mean, out of all the tours we've done. Like it's really rare to see like other bands warm up. I thought more bands like warmed up, but we we spend like an hour every day like warming up before he plays. Mm -hmm. You know as much as we can. Sometimes the shows are rushed where we only get like 10, 15 minutes to warm up. But I don't know. As far as surprises, I mean, sometimes we'll on this tour. I actually found myself talking a little trash to the to the audience, like <laughs> not not instigating them, and they're not mean me to us, but but in a way like in a fun way. Like I remember. Um, Right before we started uh, the song Drifting Figures in Bakersfield, some kid touched my guitar and he touched it up, but he was pushing it on the headstock and I'm trying to talk in the mic and he's sitting there pushing my headstock back. <laughs> and I remember going, this next song is called Drifting Figures, don't touch my guitar. But it was so, it was so <laughs> quick, it was so quick that just like when it comes to me like talking, I'm really good with like my improv as far as like being real quick to, to respond to someone. So it just happened so quick and then, you know, I hear everybody laughing because it's a real quiet part of the, the song and then... It was some other stuff like the lights were too bright, so I was saying like the audience was complaining that the lights were too bright and that they were too hot. So I was like blaming everything on the first couple of people in the front, and they're all yelling and stuff like that. But that's a lot of fun. Like I think people think we're super serious and very just you know straightforward as far as like our guitar playing and stuff. But we're actually all we joke around and we have a lot of fun. So we'll see we'll see what happens tonight. I guess it just all depends on the audience. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. If they if they give me some, you know, I'm going to take a lot. So if they give me right. just the tiniest little bit of, you know, room to to mess with them, like I'll definitely do it. Yeah. Cool. Thanks to Devin Townsend, I guess. He's probably, <laughs> he was probably a bad influence as far as <laughs> messing with the crowd cuz he does it better than like anybody I've ever seen. Like yeah. I mean, I saw him with Strapping Young Lad and it was the angry Devin Townsend then and that was like almost 10 years ago now and it was just just trash talking to the crowd, you know, and, and really getting them fired up. And then now it's like a totally different Devin. It's like the jokester Devin. And it's like he just says some just nuts, like outrageous stuff on stage. It's just like every night blew my mind because he's like improving every night and never know what he's going to say. And like every night was just like shocking. It's like, what did he just say? We'll be sitting backstage and have to run out there to see the crowd's response. And so, yeah, we'll see. I'm sure it'll get worse over time, you know as I get older and, you know, less nervous on stage, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what can we expect in the future uh, from Scale the Summit as far as sound and uh, things that you guys will be putting out? Well, we'll never write the same record, I'll tell you that. A lot right. of people were shocked that the new record was a lot darker, mm. but that's what I told every interview that we've done so far is that like, like, we're not going to write the same record. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to write Carbon Desert's Canyons 2, 3, 4, 5, you know? It's like, yeah, we, we're always going to keep our same, like, epic, happy, journey vibe, but like the new one is just, I think it just happened. But the cool thing, that's the cool thing about being instrumental is we can kind of do whatever we want because we're not just a metal band with a screamer to where we got to have those riffs so he can scream on. We can just chill out like we did on the end of Wells where it just kind of just chills out and gets all jazzy. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I mean. We're not really pigeonholed, I guess you could say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. um, we can pretty much go wherever, what direction we want, choose to. And this, you know, on this new record, we definitely explored some yeah. darker territories which we had never done before, and mm -hmm. fans seem to be enjoying it. So yeah, it's just a different change of pace. Like it's not just the fact that it took people off guard. It's just, it's just a totally different vibe altogether. It's a lot mellower. It's a little bit more down tempo. But as we get older, as just people. Like mm -hmm. our sound's definitely going to change and evolve on its own without us thinking about it. But so it'll be it'll be exciting to see what we do on the next record. I've already I'm always writing, so I've already started like working on stuff for like our next CD because I don't like getting pressured into having to write with a time schedule. So I'm always writing, and I don't know. We'll see. Right now, um, it's I don't know. It's it's different even from what we just released. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Mm. Yeah, I don't think we'll ever shock anybody though. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think that's ever going to happen. So we'll see, though. Yeah. Who knows? Gotcha. Yeah.
So um, you uh, described your new album as uh, much darker and gloomier. What would you say uh, prompted you to uh, uh, get in with that tide? I don't know. It just kind of happened because before Carbon Desert Canyons came out, what we're going to do for the lesson today, The Levitated, is, is darker. I actually wrote that and Immersion before Carbon Desert Canyons even came out. It was mm -hmm. done, but I had written that song before then. And I don't know. I think it's because... The last song we worked on for Carbon News of Canyons was Sargasso Sea, and that was actually the darkest, I think, of that entire record. So I feel like I was kind of already like venturing off into like darker tones, mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure, sure why. I don't think I was listening to anything that was darker at the time. Mm -hmm. No, I, I know you did mention one thing. Like it, We have a lot of clean tapping stuff that we're kind of one thing we're kind of mm -hmm. known for, and most of the stuff we've done like that has been more major happy sounding. And I, mm -hmm. Chris definitely did mention to me at, at one time that we wanted to keep that same theme, but just make it different, make different, it darker, yeah. make it more See. minor. So, yeah. yeah. Would you care to mention uh, any uh, bands that you would like to see with you on tour? Well, um, I don't know about you know opening up for us, but as bands that we would like to support on the road would um, just to name a few would be Deftones, Opeth. Hmm. And uh, you know, minus the bear, we, we'd like to branch out maybe a little bit from the, from yeah. the metal scene. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Steve Vai or Joe Satriani would be absolutely Mastodon incredible. Would be Mastodon, perfect, especially with the mm -hmm. new record. Yeah. Mastodon oh. would be really good. Uh, bear, we like to tour at Baroness yeah. and mm -hmm. um, Dream Theater again. Yeah, in Europe. So. <laughs> yeah, in Europe. We were we were we wish we would have got the Progressive Nation in Europe, um, but uh, and then we also had like the invite to South America, but like funding is yeah. funding was not not where it is because you have to fly from city to city there mm. and that gets kind of like intense with you know four band members and you got to rent gear and all that so but yeah. who else um i just had another one <laughs> and i'm sure everybody we get so many requests for animals as leaders like that one's gonna have to happen mm. eventually like we know we know tosin we know like all the guys in animals leaders now but uh, I've known Tosin like a while through when he was playing reflux he just kept in contact through the internet whatever but and see each other when we come through on tour but it, like that's one tour I think like we're both kind of like avoiding at the moment because we're kind of both doing our own thing. But that's yeah. one that like we talked to our label about. It's like it's gonna have to happen regardless of when and who is, is trying to stop it from happening. That tour has to happen eventually. So yeah, yeah. It's just um, a must. We'd also love to tour with Devin Townsend again because yeah, that, that was, was so awesome. much fun. Hmm. But um, yeah, those would probably be our top choices. So yeah. Hopefully that'll yeah. happen sometime in the future. Yeah. <laughs> What would you uh, say as far as uh, advice to uh, other bands trying to follow in your footsteps, trying to do what you guys did? Well, actually, believe it or not, on this tour, every other show had an instrumental band like opening, which I found to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Because when we were doing, when we were first starting out, I mean, we couldn't even get clubs to write us back. You know, they're like, oh, instrumental? Oh no, they'll never draw anybody. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's like, and, and now look at what all we've done. Now we have like clubs that actually write us, asking us to do our headlining shows at their venues and stuff like that. And, it's like, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's like you had, you had your chance when we wanted help. No. Uh, but most of them are, you know, like Houston venues and stuff like that. And we've definitely come a long way. But as far as, like, advice, it's really just you have to constantly promote and constantly, you know, be practicing and writing. And just it, the band has to be, like, 100% of your life to really, to really have a chance. Like, you can't. It's hard. I know some people do it. But it's hard to have, like, a full-time job and then also run a band. It's like it's just not possible. Like, when we move back from... Uh, LA to pursue the band this is before anything happened I told myself I'm gonna just teach lessons so I can have uh, and make a better income and work a lot less hours that way I can have all the time in the world to spend on the band that's exactly what me and him did when we got back is that way we had time you know what we needed to to work for no money for the first few years to really get the band going and it's like I said you know we did 3,000 handwritten demos and you just pass them out you never know who's gonna end up you know well, whose hands it's gonna end up in and um, and just playing a lot of shows, like tightening up your live sound. And then, I mean, I think the hardest thing for most bands is just to be able to write songs that people are going to like. Like, you never know. Like, when we started MI, we had so many doubters, like, just on the fact that we were instrumental. And, and if it's instrumental or not, like, I mean, the best advice is just you just have to work 24-7 on your band. It's like, it has to be, it has to be dedicated to your life. And now with the internet, I mean... There's so many free uh, marketing tools on the web that you take advantage of it. And if you don't, it's like you're missing out on a lot. Because we, we owe a lot to like being able to promote on the internet. I mean, that was mm -hmm. the biggest thing. Like, I couldn't imagine what it would be like, you know, 10 years ago when there was no Facebook or MySpace. And 
you, you know, that MySpace was just coming out like a few years after that, I think. And uh, without that, it's just like you had to tour, but no instrumental bands were really touring besides, you know, guys like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani. But mm -hmm. those guys, you know, played in bands uh, before that kind of helped get their popularity up. So, but that's mm -hmm. all it is. And now, now we're at a point to where we even feel like we still have a lot of work left. And all it is now for us is you have to tour, 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 and constantly have to be working. Right. So, so now we're just going to try and tour as much as we can. And we've got definitely like a lot of touring lined up for throughout the rest of the year. So we'll see how it goes.